Well, welcome everyone to this webinar. I see we have the uh, attendees uh, starting to join us here online. Let me start by welcoming you to this, our third webinar in this webinar series. We've already discussed tourism and protected areas in our first two webinars, and now we continue on with financial resilience for protected areas. My name's Ryan Fincham, and I'm gonna be your moderator for the session today. I'm the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at CSU and one of the organizers of this webinar series, along with my co-director, Jim Barbarak, our program manager, Aaron Hicks, and our colleagues at the US Forest Service and National Programs. Today, we also have the support of Audrey Ramsey, a master's student in our conservation leadership master's program here at CSU. Let me uh, first start by providing you all with a brief overview of this webinar series for those of you that are that are new to the series. And then we'll quickly jump into the topic that has brought you all here today, financial resilience and protected areas. Or quoting a Hollywood movie, this could also be known as the show me the money webinar. And we're gonna have an amazing conversation with our, with our guest uh, panels, panelists today as well. So this 2020-2021 uh, bilingual two-part webinar series is focused on global protected area issues and is entitled Protected Areas for All. It's organized by the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and the US Forest Service International Programs. Part one is taking place uh, right now, August, September, and October, and is focused on building resilience. And part two uh, will take place in February, March, and April of 2021, and will be focused on equity and inclusion in protected areas. Our purpose for this webinar series is to ensure that we have a space to share and connect during these trying times. And the topic today is something we've likely all been thinking about, probably not only at work, but at home as well. How are we going to survive the dramatic financial shifts that are taking place during this pandemic preparing, thinking now, and, and projecting and planning for the future. So we invite you to stay tuned for this webinar series, um, either through our website or through our Facebook page and join any of the sessions that you are interested in. Thank you to everyone for joining. I see that we have quite a few people now online. Um, and as you log in and join us, we'd like to ask that you initially use the chat function to uh, say hello and let us know where you're joining us from. So use that chat function, let us know where you're from. And if you're so inclined, since we're discussing and thinking about financial resilience, why don't you also put into the chat, um, what has been your organization's most important financial support during the pandemic? What has helped, helped, uh, helped see you through to this, to this stage? So feel free to, uh, to add those two things to the chat um, as we start uh, and, and get started here. Beyond that, if you have questions for our panelists throughout the session today, we'd like to ask you to use the question and answer function on Zoom for those questions, for those specific questions that you want to direct to any one of our three panelists. It's the best way for us to track those questions and make sure that we get them answered either today or in a follow-up um, in a follow-up post to our website. Aaron Hicks will be monitoring the questions that you're sending in through the question and answers function. And towards the end of the session, we'll be bringing Aaron in to um, ask a few of those questions. We're gonna keep this session to exactly an hour or as close as we can to an hour in length, as we know you all have uh, many things going on and likely need to Zoom from this Zoom to another Zoom. So uh, we'll do our best to stay on track. So with that in mind, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and start talking about financial resilience and protected areas. Um, first, we're gonna get to know our panelists and learn a little bit more about uh, what, what it is that they do uh, on, a, on a normal and regular ongoing basis, and also a little bit about how they've adapted what they're doing um, to the current pandemic situation, and then we'll jump into some more questions. Um, today, we have with us Kathleen Fitzgerald, Head of Business Consulting of the African Division of Conservation Capital. Thank you, Kathleen, for being here. We have Ben Johnson, National Recreation Special Use Program Lead for the U.S. Forest Service. Thanks, Ben. And we have our very own Jim Barbarak, co-director of our Center for Protected Area Management here at Colorado State University. 
I thank Jim for being here, but he has no other option because this is what he does all the time. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'll go ahead and kick it over to Kathleen. If you would be willing, Kathleen, and then we'll go from Kathleen to Ben to Jim. If you could just provide us a brief summary of uh, your normal job responsibilities, what it is that you're working on, what it is that you do, and then anything unique that you're working on now because of COVID. So thanks, Kathleen. Sure. Um, and thanks, everyone. It's really fun to see in the chat where everyone's from. Um, I'm getting dizzy with all the countries. It's wonderful. And obviously, it's, it's a very relevant topic. And, and so thank you for organizing this. I think the reason why there are so many people on is because we're all struggling with how do you sustain our protected areas um, during COVID. Um, and so that's what I've been focusing on. I'm, I'm an ecologist by training. Uh, did my research on wolves in Canada. Um, but for the last 13 years, Africa has been my home. And I've had the pleasure of working all over sub-Saharan Africa um, on large landscape scale conservation. And my current role is with a company called Conservation Capital. And we focus on helping our clients who are African governments, individuals, communities, um, to create financial resilience for protected areas. Um, so since COVID, we've been quite busy um, because what COVID has done is it has cast the light on the fragility of the entire structure of conservation in Africa. And I, you know, conservation capital works all over the world, but I'll focus my comments on Africa because that's what I focus on. So really what I've been spending most of my time on is working with our partners, with our clients on um, exploring what are the resiliency models that can be adopted for protected areas? How can we diversify away from tourism and donor support? And how do we ensure more sustainability long-term? And I hope we can get into some of those aspects with the questions and discussion. And I'll leave it at that, Ryan. Great, thank you, Kathleen, appreciate that. Ben. Yeah, thanks, Ryan, and, and hello, everyone. My name is Ben Johnson, and I work for the United States Forest Service, which is part of the US Department of Agriculture. And my role currently with the Forest Service is managing our Recreation Special Uses Program, um, which is sort of a nondescript title. Uh, but what it really means is working with our over 40,000 permit holders across the uh, National Forest System landscape that provide recreational opportunities to um, tourists, both domestic and international. So that's everything from outfitters, guides, people running rafting trips, nonprofits taking youth out for their first backpacking trip, all the way to campground operators, private resorts, um, even things like marathons and, and trail races. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty diverse program. Uh, it brings in about $70 million to the agency or the US government every year. And then obviously that has multiplier effects um, in, in local economies around the country. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing with COVID, it's been an interesting year, like it has, I think, with everyone. Um, we're, we're being asked and we're asking questions that we never thought we'd have to, uh, to find answers for uh, in order to, to support our permittees. Uh, many of which have, have been hit very hard uh, with pandemic related issues. And uh, so I hope to share some of our experiences over the last eight or nine months and, and also about the program in general. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan, you're on mute. Jim, go ahead, feel free and uh, join us and uh, give us an update. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, and as was mentioned, it's incredible to see what looks like a little United Nations here uh, in the chat room of people from around the world participating. It's good to see all of you and, and thank you for spending part of your day with us. I'm Jim Barbrack, co-director uh, with Ryan Fincham of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University. Um, I've been at CSU for 11 years. Uh, before that, uh, I spent much of my career living and based in Costa Rica and working for the BINGOs, the big international NGOs as they're called, on conservation projects, particularly in Latin America on different aspects of protected area uh, and corridor planning and, and management. And I've had the opportunity to work in about 30 countries around the world. 
And um, my undergraduate and masters are from Ohio State University. And uh, I never took a course in conservation finance, as many people that study forestry, wildlife, uh, outdoor recreation do. Uh, we, we, we got into conservation for other reasons that didn't necessarily have to do with finance. But over our careers, we've learned that having a fundamental aspect of where money comes from for protected area management and conservation in general is of absolute vital importance for any conservationist. And building your skills uh, through short courses, through training, through observation, through reading, and what are the different ways that you as a protected area manager in the field or as a regional center office staffer or representative of an NGO at any level from grassroots up to international, building our capacity in the area of how to find more resources, financial and otherwise, to manage protected areas is a huge challenge. And I wanna leave you with this thought that I hope we can come back to throughout the, uh, the presentation. The leaders of the world uh, next year will be meeting in China in which they will come up with new goals for the following decade in regards to protected area management. The current goals for 2020 are 17% of the world uh, land area protected and 10% of its seas. The more ambitious goals that are anticipated to be approved next year are 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the world's land surface and marine surface under protection. Now, forgetting about COVID for a moment and the special challenges it, it poses to all of us, imagine a world where in nine years, the leaders are going to pledge to double the world's terrestrial protected area and triple the marine protected area. And that in an era where budgets are also and personnel levels are already stretched to limit in protected area systems, public and private around the world. So that is the challenge we face. How to, do, how to do more, how to work with greater efficiency and effectiveness and diversify the streams of revenue and outside funding for our protected areas. That's what, that's what I work on most days and uh, it's become particularly challenging uh, during this COVID era. Great, Jim, thank you. And thanks to all three of you for, uh, for all the work that you're doing. I know you're thinking a lot and providing a lot of support to uh, organizations around the world that are, that are trying to figure out how to get through. And that, that kind of leads us to our first question. Um, I think many protected area uh, management agencies around the world are, are, are trying to just figure out how to get through the current pandemic. And so, but the first question I'd like to, to throw to all three of you is what are some of the immediate initial steps uh, or immediate current steps that protected area management agencies can take, um, are taking that you've seen from, from your experiences um, to kind of weather the current COVID financial storm, you know, particularly related to uh, revenue lo immediate revenue losses that, that these agencies are already experiencing and also potential upcoming related budget cuts that are likely um, already happening and potentially might get worse before they get better. So what are some of the things you're seeing and what, what are some of the recommendations you would have for managers for what they can do immediately? Let's start first with Kathleen. Great, thanks Ryan. Um, so in Africa, you know, we have an extraordinary network of protected areas, about 7,800. Um, so approximately 17% of the continent is protected area. And even prior to COVID, um, we were already dealing with a massive financial gap. So some colleagues and I, about three years ago, we published a paper on how much do you need to protect protected areas with lions? So we used lions as a proxy for ecological health. And, and the answer was one billion per year, which is a big ticket item. Um, but most of you have probably seen just last week, the Polson Institute, they released a, an assessment globally of the financial gap for biological diversity and their numbers were roughly um, 598 to 824 billion. So that, just sets the context um, and going back to Africa, even before COVID, we were dealing with a massive financial gap. And so Jim commented on this global target of increasing protected areas, which is wonderful. But in Africa, we're scrambling and saying, sure, how do we even support the existing 17%? And so what we're seeing now with COVID um, is this immediate crisis, 
when you think that a majority of the conservation funding for Africa's protected area system comes from tourism, between 70 to 80%, right? And the rest is donor related. And some of that donor funding is linked to tourism, right? So we see the tourists who come over and they get excited and they connect to a place and then they give financially. So it's a massive chunk of funding which literally has shut down overnight. And the way we're looking at this crisis is three phases. Right now we're in the emergency phase. And, and we're saying this is zero to 12 months. Let's hope that's correct, right? Um, the next phase is really about sustaining and restructuring. So that's the next one to two years. How do we straight restructure our systems to be more resilient and diversified? And then the final is the recovery and building stronger. And that's three to five years. So to your question, Ryan, and, and I just wanted to provide some context there for Africa, we're in this crisis phase. Um, money, literally the faucet has shut off. And so protected area authorities are scrambling. What we're seeing is number one, they have come up with very concise budgets for what they need to just maintain basic operations. How many rangers do you need on the ground? How much do you need to maintain presence? That's number one. Number two, how much do you need in uh, non-government protected areas? So community conservancies, community conservation areas. How much do you need to pay those concession fees? Right, so in the Maasai Mara, we have 15 community owned conservancies, which now surpass the size of the Maasai Mara Reserve where the wildebeest migration takes place. And in those conservancies, every year we need approximately $7 million just to keep that habitat open for wildlife. Those are lease fees that are paid to community members to keep it open. So that's the other key figure. How, do, how much do you need to just do those payments? concession fees, lease fees, conservation fees. So we have seen that. We've seen some really good work in terms of very concise budgets. Here's what we need in the short term. And, and lastly, what we've seen is an influx of funding, which is wonderful. So we've seen governments stepping up. The government of Kenya, for example, um, is paying for ranger support, which is wonderful. Um, we've seen donors stepping up, which is great, European Union, USAID, large donors, as well as private foundations. We've also seen, for example, with the communities, they've also decreased their costs. So for example, that Masai Mara example I just gave you, the landowners have agreed to a 50% reduction over the next 12 months. So they've met us halfway, which is wonderful. So. That's a bit of a snapshot in terms of what's happening now, now with the crisis. And I think later we can talk more about building stronger and more resilient. Wonderful, Kathleen. Thank you for that overview. That's, that's it's lots of things to think about there already. Um, ben, um, what, you know, this for, from you, we're really interested to hear a very specific agency perspective. So we're, you know, the question is really directed at what, what all these, what are all the different agencies doing and how they're working and, and making this work around the world. Um, you know, you can probably give us some really concrete and specific examples about how the Forest Service is working right now to weather this storm. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, you know, there's some interesting parallels between what, what we've been experiencing and what Kathleen just described. So there's, um, th there were issues in terms of recreation infrastructure that existed prior to COVID and have existed and been exacerbated through uh, the last nine months. And it's fairly well publicized at this point, but, you know, we have a very large deferred maintenance uh, issue in the in, on national forest system lands, so campgrounds, that need repairs, water systems, all those things, trails as well. Um, and so we have been working over the past two years to really increase the tools available to our individual national forests to deal with those issues. Um, so whether that's uh, partnering with state and local governments to sort of share resources and work across those jurisdictional boundaries, 
um, or it's looking at new financial models that we have brought over from other parts of the conversation space, conservation space, like resiliency bonds for recreation infrastructure. Um, we started to explore that. And then, and then when COVID-19 hit, um, I think in some ways it, it, those explorations helped us over the past eight or nine months. Um, we had already established some really strong relationships at the local level that helped us um, figure out how to work uh, with the increased use that we're seeing. Um, the anecdote that I like to describe in terms of use levels right now is, is every weekday is like a weekend and every weekend is like a national holiday. Um, <laughs> and so that's the level of use that's occurring on our national forest system lands. And, and it's, on one hand, it's a great thing, right? It's great having all these people that have never been to these protected spaces, discovering them for the first time because it's the only game in town. It's the only option available. At the same time, um, it exacerbates our infrastructure problems. Um, and really, we've been in that response mode, I'd say, for the past, well, for the summer season, um, basically doing whatever we can to uh, minimize impacts to the landscape while also getting people outside because that's the sort of relief they need uh, in this time. And then we're only now starting to transition to what I would, I guess, is the recovery uh, period. And, and we've benefited from um, some interesting things that have, some of which have been in the works for a while and some which are recovery related. Um, so as an agency, we did receive funds through the CARES Act uh, that was passed, uh, I believe in April, um, to provide some kind of emergency supplemental funding to national forests, which goes to very practical things like cleaning toilets, uh, hiring more seasonals to inform people um, where they can and, and can go when they're going on a hike. Um, and then additionally, there's been a long, long running narrative of this deferred maintenance problem. And, and it's been interesting because we've also had another bill passed, the Great American Outdoors Act, um, that is providing some very real recovery tools for the agency. Um, so that permanently funded uh, something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a, a big uh, pool of resources that federal agencies use to acquire more lands to be put into, um, into management by whatever agency. And then it is also for five years providing a considerable amount of funding to public land management agencies uh, to work on our, our infrastructure issues. So. Uh, the Forest Service as an agency, um, we're still getting organized around this, but we're going to receive approximately $280 million a year each year for the next five years to put into deferred maintenance. Um, granted, our deferred maintenance uh, backlog is about $5 billion, so um, there is more work to do, but it is a pretty substantial step that will help us not only in our long-running problems, but also help uh, the agency as well as local communities in the recovery process. Great, thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. And um, I know that uh, uh, tourism and recreation is one piece of the financial picture, and we've already had several webinars about that. But I think there's no doubt that the international visitation basically came to a halt, and yet local visitation. Uh, re remain such an important part of the landscape. And there's no doubt that that heavy local recreational use um, in some, in probably some major way, encouraged our uh, politicians um, to pass a law uh, such as the one you're talking about uh, to, to bring additional resources to strengthen that. And so I just think reiterating the importance of building local recreation programs around the world in protected areas, in addition to the possibility of bringing international revenue is so important, not only for finances, but also for, for political support for protected areas. Jim, what, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? I know you work uh, in a, in a complementary region of the world to Kathleen and, and not only uh, be, being based in the US, but working so much in Latin America over the years. Uh, what are you hearing people doing uh, immediately to help weather this storm? Well, I'd say some things are positive and some are not. I'll start with some of the negatives. There have been much publicized moves by the uh, national, the federal protective agency of Mexico to dramatically reduce payrolls and operating expenses. There was immediate pushback by large sectors in the country, including the tourism sector, conservation sector. So some of that's been reversed. The same thing happened in Ecuador 
And the same thing happened in Brazil's, one of its most important state systems in Sao Paulo, where they attempted to do away with the state park agency and there was incredible pushback. And of course, Sao Paulo is, uh, Brazil's California with 50 million people and a very large, uh, uh, well-loved uh, uh, protected area system at the state level. So many of these cases, when governments have quickly tried to react and, and use uh, COVID as an excuse to cut things maybe that they wanted to cut anyway, uh, fiscal conservative governments, uh, it's been a demonstration of the high levels of public support for conservation, uh, even in those emergency uh, emerging economies, which is, which is great to see. Uh, on the positive side, I'd say that agencies around the world, both, both public protect area agencies and the increasingly large number of private conservancies, private nature reserves around the world, run by NGOs or run by individual owners, be they corporations with hotels in the private reserves or just uh, individual property owners. Uh, they're, they're, they're doing all they can to reduce expenditures, to put off, to defer maintenance uh, instead of, uh, and so basically putting off what does not require to be done immediately, reducing hiring, reducing contracting to try to reduce fixed cost, which is a, a mantra I always try to teach people in uh, protected area finance courses. You want to try to keep your fixed costs low but not at the expense of crippling your agencies or of uh, debilitating local communities with which uh, cooperation is fundamental. Uh, I think that one of the big issues is that there's a great difference between enterprise agencies like US state parks, many of those systems like ours in Colorado get no money uh, from their state budgets. Uh, they depend totally on fees uh, and excise taxes at the state and federal level for their operations and, and camping fees and concessionaire uh, royalties and things like that. And so they face a very uh, similar challenge to, an, to a company uh, and they can't print money and they can't deficit spend by, by, by law. So they face one, one set of realities uh, and in the United States, an interesting thing to go with the increased uh, visitation that was mentioned earlier, hunting and fishing license sales are reinvested in conservation. That's usually important in the United States. It, 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 it provides billions of dollars over decades for conservation. And I just saw in Minnesota, fishing license sales up 34% this year. In Colorado, hunting and fishing license sales up. Campground reservations, you cannot book a campground. You can't even buy a good quality bike in the United States today because so many people are, are getting back into biking right now. And so interest in outdoor recreation is important, but the hunting and fishing community, when they buy a license or they buy equipment, there's an excise tax on it, over 10%. And all that money goes back into conservation. If you buy binoculars to watch birds, or if you buy skiing equipment, none of that goes in. So there's a, a, a big opportunity to potentially levy excise taxes on other types of outdoor recreation equipment. And so that's getting a lot of traction now. Another thing that hasn't been approved yet, but we're talking about in the United States, is increasing the importance of employment generation schemes for, for unemployed youth through Conservation Corps. So we have several bills in our Congress right now following after those other successful bills that Ben just mentioned to try to redouble our efforts on Conservation Corps. This is something we've been doing in the US for 80 years and it's now been done, for example, with help from the US Forest Service in countries like, like Honduras creating Youth Conservation Corps. My dad got out of being a coal miner in deep mines and in the middle of the depression in the United States in one of these Conservation Corps and helped build infrastructure 80 years ago in Ohio State Parks that's still used today. So these, uh, these types of employment generation schemes are being looked at by a number of countries as part of the recovery uh, uh, approaches to, uh, to COVID, but that could potentially be something that, that could be used uh, internationally to both help deal with maintenance issues and create, unemployment, uh, create employment among underprivileged people in communities that live in and around protected areas. So, so those are some of the things I'm hearing and, and a lot of innovation, you know, it's a terrible thing to waste a good crisis. And uh, uh, this crisis really has a lot of people being innovative and looking at ways to uh, diversify and increase their revenue streams and reduce dependence on just one leg on their tables, like was mentioned in the case of tourism in Africa. Great, thanks, you. thanks, Jim. Thanks for for providing us both of that some of the some of the downsides, which is just part of the reality that we all have to be aware of, as well as uh, some of the the unique things that are happening um, throughout the world. Um, kind of st staying on that track and thinking about uh, what 
what makes us hopeful for the future and thinking about what might be some of the good positive news uh, coming out of this COVID situation and maybe hard to see some of that positive news right now. But, um, you know, I'd love to hear from each of you about uh, what makes you hopeful for the future and what, what, some of the, what are some of the new innovative approaches that might be coming down the pipe. Um, Kathleen, in, in, in your case, I'm, you know, I, I think we'd all really be especially interested in hearing a little bit more about <clears throat> what you are already thinking about in terms of resiliency models and, and, and economic diversification for, for African park agencies. Um, uh, if you could provide us a little bit more information about, about the work you're doing on that and, and any other things that, 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 uh, that make you positive for the future or hopeful for the future. Sure, thanks, Ryan. Uh, you know, in terms of being hopeful for the future, as Jim said, let's take advantage of the crisis, right? Um, and what we are seeing is finally a recognition and an acknowledgement on the need to diversify, which is great, right? Um, no, no point in harboring on the past that we should have figured that out 50 years ago. So we are seeing that now, which is great. Um, the other good news in Africa is that a lot of these innovative models already exist, right? So for example, carbon credits, the first verified carbon credit project was done in Kenya with wildlife works in the Cassie-Gao corridor between Savo East and Savo West National Park. Um, we've also seen some amazing projects in Tanzania on community conservation areas. So carbon credits already exist as a model in Africa that can be replicated and that can be scaled. Um, and let's remember COVID is a 2020 to 2023 issue, hopefully. Climate change is a 2030 issue, right? And, and let's remember that before this crisis, a number of companies committed to carbon credit targets. And so we need to hold them accountable for that and engage them in a positive way in mitigation strategies in Africa. So that's number one. Um, number two, and I noted um, Mamadou Ndiaye is on this call from Senegal. Um, there are biodiversity offsets projects that have taken place in Africa. So Africa is seeing this incredible boom in development. Again, we could look at that as a negative or we can say, how do we harness that growth to support conservation? So the example in Senegal is a mining project outside of Neocolacoba National Park. And that mining company has chosen to offset their impact and they're doing so in partnership with the Protected Area Authority of Senegal to support the management of Neocolacoba National Park, second largest park in West Africa, extremely important for lion and other key species recovery. So again, that template exists and it's working. How do we replicate that? Um, the third thing, and, and again, there are lots of examples of innovative finance models that are working, the debt for nature swap in the Seychelles, um, the Rhino impact bond in South Africa, um, the third thing we're seeing a lot of is an increase in collaborative management partnerships, otherwise known as co-management agreements, right? And I call them collaborative management partnerships because it, that depicts what these are, which are really a collaboration between a private sector partner, it might be an NGO, and a protected area authority. And what that has done is it's enhanced protected area management. It's brought different skills to the protected area authorities, and it's helped attract funding. And so we are seeing an increase in that, in particular from countries who prior to COVID have said, we really don't need that as an option. And now they're saying, how do we explore that together? And how do we make sure this is gonna work well for our country? So Africa already has incredible innovative solutions that we have done. Now the focus needs to be replicate that and scale that up. And lastly, I see in the chat, there's been a lot about private land versus um, public land, for example. And indeed in private land, you can be a bit more creative and, and diversify even more. So for example, um, livestock, um, livestock value in terms of generating revenue for communities and conservation. You can do that on private lands and we've seen success in that. So 
an increase in creativity, replication of models that have worked. Um, it does make me optimistic about coming through this. Wonderful, thank you, Kathleen. That's great. A lot of uh, a lot of good ideas to get us going, and I appreciate the chat too. Uh, um, looks like you have uh, some some colleagues here that are uh, adding in some some great uh, links um, to uh, organizations that are doing um, impressive work. I encourage all of you that are joining us today. If you have additional ideas, additional creative, innovative ideas, uh, other messages of hope please continue to engage in the chat, share all the information and ideas that you have. Um, that helps us lay, uh, level the playing field here and, and ensure that all of your great ideas are also woven into uh, in this webinar. So thank you all for those of you that are contributing. Ben, let's go to you and, and hear, uh, hear about what, what, what gets you uh, um, excited for the future, hopeful for the future, and, 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 uh, what, and what's, what's kind of really, really working for you all. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, I, I think what, what gives me hope, and it's perhaps not uh, so much related to the financial side of things, but um, the Forest Service as an agency, we're extremely decentralized. So we have, you know, 500 something offices across the country, and our employees very much live in the communities that they, they work and serve in. Um, but even with that, I think historically, our relationships can get pretty transactional, um, just because of the pace of life. And I, I think what's, what I've noticed over the past nine months is just this increased um, level of grace and empathy as we work internally and externally with our partners and our permittees. Um, you know, we put in some sort of national guidance of deferring billing and working with our permittees so that they can move to different areas of the landscape so that they can still run their trips as best as possible um, and really focusing on um, the sort of we're all in this together mentality in terms of land management and working through the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, it, it took a pandemic to maybe push, push that to where um, it should have been for some time. Uh, but what gives me hope is that it'll, it'll, that level of grace, that level of empathy and relationship building will maintain for years to come in terms of how we view these landscapes, how we view uh, the partners we work for, whether that's an NGO or that's a private entity, and that we're all, um, that we all care about these places at the same level, um, and that we're kind of have these um, alignment and goals and desires for how we treat them and how we manage them, and then how uh, the public enjoys them. Great. Thank you, Ben. Jim. So, I think that the current situation is one in which protected areas around the world, particularly in developing nations, we're already facing a whole series of long-standing threats. Poaching, encroachment, uh, water pollution, uh, even where use, uh, extractive use was allowed, poor management and supervision of that. So all of the usual ills that protected areas face combined with low budgets and inadequate staff. On top of that, now we have an additional crisis. We've already talked about it. how do you react positively to this crisis situation. Now, I think that there's going to be a lot of ingenuity, there's going to be a lot of entrepreneurship, and, and I just hope, and, and I, uh, this is a sincere hope, is that many times policies of central governments, and they're not of the conservation agencies, they're the finance ministries and the, the budget offices and the like, that, that tie the hands of even the most entrepreneurial protected area manager or national system director. Uh, I'll give you a good example. There are many countries around the world where we can go out and make partnerships, but all the money generated by the concessions or the entrance fees goes right back into central government coffers. That creates a tremendous disincentive to a ranger to actually charge people at the gate or for a park manager to make sure that uh, all the revenue is being collected that should be collected. So I think one of the things that we can take advantage of in this situation is to try to create more incentives for government sector personnel working in conservation to be more entrepreneurial and obviously working in partnerships with for-profit and non-profit uh, partners, including communities and indigenous groups. So I, I think that that's something that has to happen because there's a lot of good ideas out there. And the problem is not that the idea exists or that wouldn't be applicable and we couldn't scale it up but some arcane clause in a finance law from decades ago 
that basically hampers innovation and entrepreneurship in the public sector. So that's one thing I think that's uh, that's going to be uh, be important to look at. And another is with this huge boom of additional protected areas, because government ministers and politicians love to cut ribbons and 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 uh, particularly in a, in an election year and do things that are politically um, uh, politically favorable to them. But then uh, they don't follow through with the resources and staff to actually manage these new parks once created. So I, I think that uh, in that particular arena, this balance between what the existing areas need and what these new areas will require, requires the international financing community to step up the bat. And as was mentioned, we, we need an order of magnitude, basically more finance over the coming decade uh, from a variety of sources, including uh, more, gen more revenue generation in protect areas, but also support from the national and international community. I think a couple things maybe we have not mentioned uh, our environmental service payments besides carbon. Uh, most of the world's potable water in many countries comes out of water factories, which are cloud forest and uh, which generate potable water, irrigation water, and hydropower, which is gonna be increasingly important in many countries in spite of the problems with big dams. Uh, but small scale hydro is booming in a lot of places. So finding ways so that when we protect the water factories, that part of the money generated by those water systems gets reinvested. So that, that's an additional leg to stand on in addition to carbon and in addition to revenue from tourism operations. Great, thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you all for um, kind of pointing us in a, in a positive direction. There's, there's days, I think, when we all are super positive and ready to embrace this challenge and, and see what's next. And there's also days where, you know, we just would like to turn over and go back to bed and wish this all to go away. But uh, so it's always good to have uh, some positive reinforcement. Uh, on on uh, on some on some future directions, um, I, I'd like to I'd like to invite uh, Aaron Hicks, uh, who's been uh, monitoring some of the questions that we received, to see if uh, she can join us here online and and uh, and uh, share share some of the questions from the audience. And thank you so much to all who have sent in their questions. Um, there seems to be quite a bit of interest about the role of the private sector and also. Uh, conservation finance tools such as payment for ecosystem services and I know you guys already mentioned a little bit about carbon uh, credits and private partner private public partnerships but can you speak more to the specific role of uh, pri the private sector and or um, payment for ecosystem services in uh, helping us get beyond uh, this stage this emergency phase Great, thanks, Erin. Why, why don't we start again with Kathleen? Sure, Erin, that, that's a, a whole other webinar, um, but I'll try to be brief on this. So private sector, we've already spoke about um, the role of private sector in tourism, right? So in Africa, private sector is already within the tourism sector playing a vital role in generating revenue for conservation. Um, and certainly the things that we're looking at now is how to support those private sector partners that already play a role in supporting conservation. And, and then using this time as an opportunity to incentivize other private sector partners who may not be supporting conservation, but now is an opportunity to, to catalyze their support for conservation. So that's number one within the tourism sector. Um, for co-management, we are starting to see, again, it's, it's a great opportunity to bring in private sector partners to help with management of protected areas. So we're seeing an increase in that. Um, on private land, obviously there's even a bigger role for private sector in other enterprises such, I mentioned livestock. So Take, for example, Old Pejeta Conservancy, 110,000 acre conservancy in central Kenya, and they have six forms of revenue generation, right? So tourism is one of them. So when we had a bombing in Kenya and our tourism went down, they didn't suffer as much as the others because they relied then on livestock and agriculture, right? So the privately managed conservation areas have more flexibility in terms of diversification. Um, the other role of private sector, I would say, links to my example of the biodiversity offset in Senegal. 
again, looking at private sector partners that are doing development and extraction within Africa, how do you partner with them to galvanize support for conservation? Obviously, your first step is making sure that development is compatible with conservation, right? Um, so there, there are a lot of opportunities for private sector engagement. And I think, Jim, you said in terms of policy, right? How do we influence policy right now that incentivizes private sector to do more with conservation? Um, and lastly, Aaron, on, on the payment for ecosystem services, um, huge opportunity, and Jim alluded to water. We're starting to see a lot of creative water um, payment for ecosystem service programs around water. Um, and when you look at parks in Africa, many of them protect key watersheds. Um, and so providing revenue to support the, the water flows as well as quality is, is absolutely key. And we are seeing that in Africa, and I think that will grow in the future. I think we're certainly being better at articulating the overall value of our protected areas, more than just it's pretty, it's a great place to walk, um, it saves fuzzy animals. It's actually vital for our economies and for people. And we're getting better at quantifying that because certainly governments have hard decisions to make in Africa. And so we need to give them the information that they need to make the right decisions. Wonderful, thank you, Kathleen. Um, ben, why don't we uh, go to you and see if you wanna contribute to that same question. Yeah, uh, there are a couple couple things I'll mention. And we, we definitely rely on our, our private industry partners to a great extent, especially with our recreation services that we provide. Um, so the first thing is we do have the, the legal authority to allow our permit holders to offset their fees that they pay to the government every year by doing maintenance of the sites that they use. So that could be uh, maintaining trails, campgrounds, bathrooms, et cetera. And although it seems like a fairly simple um, technique or tool, it's, it's actually quite impactful. And, and most units utilize it to a great extent. And, and permittees love it as well, because not only they're not really getting rid of their fee, but they're also, um, they're, in, they're increasing their personal investment in the sites that they use and they take people to. And therefore there's a more of a conservation ethic even that grows from them doing that maintenance. So it's, it's sort of a win-win. Um, the second area that is kind of the new or the growth area is learning from our ecosystem services partners in the agency and, and externally, and really thinking about um, sort of impact investing uh, with recreation sites. And so looking at uh, conservation finance tools to really actually increase recreation infrastructure, um, particularly as it supports rural economies and communities. Um, so for example, there's a um, project in Ohio, the state of Ohio, where we're actually working to build a, about an 80 mile mountain bike trail system in a very rural part of Ohio. Um, and we're getting investors involved uh, that are gonna put the money up front. They'll get a small return. And you know, you look at the math, you look at studies that have been done uh, and, it, and it just makes sense, right? It, it's gonna promote the rural economy of a very um, very low income area of Ohio in a new way and provide you know, jobs, economic growth, et cetera. And so that's a growth area for us. And one that I think um, will be continue to be highlighted as we kind of move into the recovery phase. Thanks, Ben. Jim. I'd like to mention just a couple of complementary ideas. Uh, one is expanded use of volunteer programs. And, and some people, particularly in developing countries, when they think volunteer, they think necessarily this is someone from abroad, a wealthy foreigner who comes in to do travel and do some philanthropy as well. Uh, most volunteers around the world, even developing countries, are local. And uh, sometimes these international volunteer programs can help subsidize the national and local programs that's been done for several decades in, in Costa Rica. Uh, so I would urge all of you to for look to ways to expand and diversify volunteer opportunities with more of an emphasis on local and regional volunteerism as well, and building a culture of volunteerism. Uh, at the national park nearest where uh, Ryan, Aaron, and I and Audrey sit, Rocky Mountain National Park, they calculate that of the 1,700 or so volunteers a year that they have, 
uh, give a total of the equivalent of 70 full-time staff positions to a park that only has 200 staff positions. So basically volunteerism increases their staff resources by 25%. Okay, and helps them deal with things like trail construction and, and litter control and doing citizen science and the like. So one thing is, is volunteerism. A second thing is that, now I come from a large public university. I studied in an era of uh, when there was a lot of uh, left of center uh, uh, movements on campus and we were all suspicious of the private sector. The fact of the matter is that in all of your countries, just about, and this would even include those of you that are watching from Cuba or from Vietnam or Venezuela, that there are private sectors. And uh, the private sector is primarily comprised of small and medium enterprises that are locally based, not of giant multinational corporations. And uh, the probabilities of being able to work more with the private for-profit entities uh, like these outfitter guides that Ben mentioned, who are local hunting and fishing guides and hiking guides and birding guides usually. Uh, th these kinds of positions, these kinds of enterprises are the majority of concessionaires and private sector partners. They're not these massive corporations. They have their role and only large corporations can be expected to manage large hotels and restaurants and invest large amounts of money when expected to for big concessions. But most concessionaires are small scale. We need to find more ways to reach out and work with the private sector, ranging from these small micro enterprises up to where appropriate, large partners and not be on a bully pulpit and not be saying, oh, they're going to privatize the park because a good concessions arrangement does not privatize a park. It actually, it actually privatizes the risk of investment and socializes the benefits so more people can enjoy public parks in more ways. So you got to get, get out of that ideological mindset that prevents us from thinking out of the box in ways we need to. The third thing I want to mention is the importance of private non nonprofit partners, groups like Africa Parks, helping many African countries manage their park systems. Uh, and uh, in the United States, something that's been vital for our national forests and parks is having many times local or national support organizations. Every recreational group in the United States, the mountain bikers, the trout fishermen, the deer hunters, the off-road uh, uh, vehicle users, all of them have user groups that lobby to their Congress uh, representatives to support conservation. And then we have friends organizations for most of our larger protected areas that help run the gift shops and that all the money they generate through sales of souvenirs and like get reinvested in educational programs and things like our junior ranger program, which has been very important in the United States for decades in our national forests and parks and state parks to create more public support for conservation. So just a, those are just a few final ideas that, that could be ramped up and used universally. Right, thank you, Jim. And, and thanks to all three of you for, uh, for the answers to this particular question. Um, we're just a, a few minutes away from really starting to wrap up here. And so I, I think I'd just like to go back, back around, around the, the rotation here one more time and, and just to see if you have any final words of uh, final words of wisdom to share with the group. Um, in, anything else specifically that we haven't had a chance to touch on that's related to this topic of financial resilience for protected areas that you'd like to share any parting, parting words for, for those that are joining us today. And we'll start with Kathleen. Thanks, Ryan. I, I think one of the key things, and, and it's a difficult question, is, is figuring out how much you really need, right? And so one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is supporting partners to develop proper business plans for protected areas. If you take Africa again as an example, a majority of our protected areas don't even have management plans. And then within those management plans, if you look at the business section, usually it's a laundry list of every single piece of equipment or building that they need. And so what we're really trying to get protected area authorities to think through is how much do you really need for protected area management? Then looking at the whole system, right? Jim alluded to revenue retention. How do you, you know, what is the revenue retention? How much should go to headquarters? How much should go back to protected areas? So really making the, the financial model work for the entire system. So start there and then look at how to develop revenue um, 
systems that can sustain the protected area. Because without that, it's shooting in the dark. And I think we need to recognize, we know that conservation area funding is limited. And so we have a responsibility to use whatever funding we have in the best way possible. And so that means really understanding what we need to sustain and manage our protected areas going forward. And then we can explore some of these creative models. But let's start with what we need. Let's start with optimizing the existing opportunities, which we feel with tourism, there are ways to increase revenue from the existing tourism models. And then let's layer in these other things going forward. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Kathleen. Uh, ben. Yeah, so um, I guess my parting words or thoughts is as someone who, who probably has about 35 years left of working in conservation and recreation, um, I've, I've really tried to approach the, the COVID-19 pandemic with an asset frame. And um, so when I have, hear these conversations and thoughts about the silver linings of this whole um, time we find ourselves in, I, I really take that to heart and think about how collectively, perhaps there are other um, early in their career folks on the on the call today, you know, we, we need to think sustainably, not only for the resource, but for us as the folks that are passionate about protecting it. Um, and take that lens as we move out of this pandemic and continue our work. Um, and, and the thing that that's really focused for me is the pandemic has highlighted the stuff in even my small program area that we used to really get um, worried about and wound up about. And it turns out it actually isn't important and these four things over here are actually the important things. And so in some ways it's helped us refocus and refine what we really need to be working on. And I hope that's an attitude we can all take forward as we um, move out of this and, and continue on with our good work. Great, thanks, Ben. Jim. So I would like to echo what Kathleen said about the importance of this is a good time as we're all sitting around and some things we'd like to do we can't do to revisit your operational plans or your annual work plans to see what you really need to do, as she mentioned, to revisit your longer term strategic or management plans for individual protected areas and for your NGOs or your government agencies. And what have we already learned about what we need to change as a result of this crisis. As part of those management plans, both short and long term, I think one thing we've learned is that every protected area needs to have a risk management strategy built in, in addition to the financial strategy or business plan that Kathleen mentioned. Uh, I've, I've been involved with other protected areas that have had earthquakes uh, uh, um, cause an interruption of revenue or an increase in cost. Major fires like we're seeing here in Colorado and across the United States West. So every protected area should be thinking more than in the past, not just about COVID and that type risk, but a whole type of range of risk uh, that can be from everything from civil, civil unrest to giant forest fires to earthquakes, floods, and hurricanes like we're also having today in the United States. We're the champion of natural disasters in the United States. We get hit from all sides and all seasons. And so one thing that managers have learned to do is you have to be prepared for these. So I'd urge all of you to think more about uh, risk assessment and uh, risk management and planning for it uh, as a result of what we've learned about how much we didn't know uh, with this uh, this COVID outbreak. And, and finally, uh, I'd like to just create try to create a sense of hope. Uh, if you're in conservation, uh, usually you didn't get, do it to become rich, to become wealthy. You do it because you have a sense of purpose about your life. Now more than ever, we have to double down on being people, thinking beyond this immediate problem, uh, maintaining a sense of hope, being optimistic, and thinking about the welfare our protected areas provide around the corner and around the world, and be, be entrepreneurial, be inventive, learn from others, take in as many Zoom webinars and PDFs as you can while we're on lockdown, and come back stronger. And one last thing I'd like to say is that I think that too many in the conservation profession still see visitation and tourism as a pain in the butt. And particularly if it's from local or regional visitors, that yes, I know they throw out more, tr more trash and they're noisier and they don't have the same ethics perhaps as an accomplished British bird watcher. But those are the folks that vote. Those are the folks that can convince decision makers to support conservation. And so we should take advantage of what in many countries, including the development countries, is an increase in demand for, for recreation and tourism of a local variety near, near cities in particular to build on that, build back better, and make our areas more user-friendly. 
Great. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to all three of you for your contributions today. I, I hope everybody that's joined us on the webinar is walking away from this with, uh, with a few additional good ideas that they might be able to put into practice or at least some new topics they might want to dive deeper in into. Um, this has been, been very helpful. And um, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, our panelists. I'd like to thank all the participants for joining us today. Um, just uh, so that you all know, we will be doing the same topic again tomorrow in Spanish for those that would like to join us for that. Um, and then um, we will also be continuing on with our webinar series um, in the month of October with sessions on October 20th and 22nd on um, the role of rangers uh, dur during uh, this period of COVID. Um, and we'll be having that session both in English and Spanish as well. So um, you should all be receiving an evaluation link as a follow-up to this call. We appreciate you filling that out and helping to provide feedback on this webinar. Um, thanks again to our entire team uh, at Colorado State University. Thanks to uh, our colleagues at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs for their collaboration on this series. And thanks to you all the participants for spending some of your time with us. We wish you all the luck uh, in the world with uh, all the challenges that you're facing. And we hope that uh, 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 people will continue to show you the money uh, so that you can continue to sustain the amazing places that you protect um, all across the planet. Uh, thank you so much. Best of luck. Take care of yourselves, your family, and your loved ones. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Take care, everybody. All right.